Hey you guys, time once again for another book review. This is another novel that I just randomly came across while I was, you know, scrolling through all the offerings on the Kindle Unlimited, you know, the free selections. And I don't know what it was about this particular book that kind of like caught my eye. Um, I guess like the cover and the title sounded kind of like mysterious. I wasn't even really sure what it was about, but I was kind of like, eh, why not? I'll give that a whirl. Now I actually checked this book out probably like a month or two ago. And because if you have Kindle Unlimited, you can check out like 10 books at once. And so I checked it out, I think, la and I was going to read it last month, and then it got uh, pushed back because somebody sent me one and all this other stuff. So I didn't get around to reading it. So I was like, oh yeah, maybe I should do that because it's been out for a couple months. And uh, I'm glad I finally got around to reading this one because I en ended up uh, enjoying this one quite a bit. So this is a book that came out back in, I believe, September of 2020, and it's called Gilchrist by Christian Gallicar. Now, I looked up the author bio, and apparently, this is kind of cool, this guy, um, I guess he got a degree in finance and worked in that field uh, for some time, but I guess he'd always kind of like had aspirations to be a fiction writer, to his horror fiction specifically, and so in 2012, he actually started writing and publishing uh, his own novels. Now, this is the first one of his that I've read. Uh, I think he's read a, uh, he's written a couple more since then. Now, one thing I will say, the guy is like, he, he says in his bio that one of his biggest influences is Stephen King. Now, when you first start reading this book, that will become very apparent. This is a very Stephen King-like book. Uh, specifically, it reminded me a great deal of It. It reminded me a great deal of a little bit of the Tommy Knockers, that type of thing. It's like a cursed town type situation. Now, some reviews of it that I read were just kind of like, nah, I'm not having it. It's, you know, it's too much like Stephen King and they couldn't really, uh, they weren't really down with it. I didn't find that. It is Stephen King-like, but not so much that I thought he was like ripping him off or it was just like a pastiche or anything like that. So, I mean, if you're a fan of this, Stephen King's kind of like big sprawling sorts of novels that are kind of all set like around one town, like maybe Under the Dome or something like that, um, then this would probably be right up your alley. Now, it doesn't wasn't just Stephen King that, this gave me vibes of. I also got a little bit of Dean Koontz from it, got a little bit of Robert McCammon in there as well, in the sense that, particularly something like Boy's Life, that's just kind of like about uh, this town and it's kind of like all these characters like in this town. So I kind of got that vibe from it as well. But yeah, it's like, I yes, it is Stephen Kingy, but not to a degree that it bothered me. And actually I really ended up liking this book a lot. And after I finished it, and I'm, shit, I started reading it one day and I read for like an hour or something. I was like, okay, I gotta stop and go do something else. But then like the next day I read the whole rest of the book and it's pretty long. It's like over 500 pages. So I basically just sat like one afternoon and like read the whole like uh, thing because I got really, really uh, into it. So what is this book about? So this book is set back in 1966 near Concord, Massachusetts. Now, at the first, the first part of the book, we're following a married couple, Peter and Sylvia Martell. Now, 18 months, two years prior to the events of the story, uh, they have lost their little boy, Noah, who I think was two or three years old, in a horrible accident. Like, he fell out a window, like, when they weren't watching him or something like that. So, obviously, they're still uh, grieving from that, and, you know, things have started to fall apart a little bit. And it was, it's not, like, disastrous or anything, but, you know, they've been kind of drinking too much. Um, Sylvia is kind of, like, you know, hitting the pills a little hard, and, you know, they're not really connecting the way they used to. You know, everything's just sort of a shadow of what it used to be. Now, they have been trying to have another child because they think that, you know, that will maybe go some way toward mending the rift, I guess. Uh, but for about 18 months, they've been having a really hard time and not being able to conceive. So they've gone to a fertility doctor, you know, it's near the beginning of the story to see if something is physically wrong. Now, the doctor says nothing's physically wrong with either one of you. So could be psychological. It could be something that we don't know what it is. So it's like, well, you know, all you can do is just keep trying. Now, Sylvia didn't really want to hear this. Um, she's already kind of depressed, like I said, not surprisingly. Uh, and this kind of like ambiguity, this lack of a reason, she's like, I almost would have felt better if they just said, hey, one of us is infertile or something, because at least then we would know. Um, but just kind of this ambiguity is really bothering her. So she kind of like gets, starts getting more and more depressed. So they have all of that going on. 
Now, Peter is actually a novelist. He's not a horror novelist. He's more kind of like a literary novelist type. He's in his, you know, apparently pretty successful at it. Like, he's kind of well-known. Now, he seems to have, not too long after this fertility doctor thing happens, he has this really, really weird dream one night. Uh, it involves kind of like, there's like a red sky and there's like a weird fucked up looking church and like these kind of like wormy things. And then this kind of like being with this really weird like face whose colors shifting face and all this other kind of stuff. Now in this dream, oh, and I think he also sees himself like as an old person, like in a reflection or something. So it's just like this really, really creepy dream that he has, and it makes like makes like a big impact. During the course of this dream, he hears a voice, and if it's a voice he doesn't recognize, saying the word Gilchrist. Now, he does not know what this is, but like I said, the dream kind of sticks with him because it's pretty creepy. Not too long after this, though, uh, he's driven to another town. I think he was at his publishers or something like that. And he was driving back to, I think they live in Concord, Massachusetts. So he's driving back to Concord on a route that he's taken many, many times before. But today he suddenly sees like a road sign, you know, that has all the cities that says Concord, this exit, you know, Worcester, this exit, whatever. But he's like, he notices that sign says Gilchrist on it and has an exit for that. And he's like, well, that's really funny. I never noticed that before. Um, he's like, but you know, it's, it's a road that he takes all the time. Maybe he just takes the signs for granted because he always knows where he's going and he's not really looking at it. And he thinks, oh, well, maybe that's why I dreamed that because I kind of like saw it and it kind of like came up in my subconscious or whatever. But he's curious enough about this Gilchrist place. And because it was in his dream, he's like, you know, I, I got a little bit of time. I'm going to like pop down to that town and see what the fuck's going on. You know what I mean? Just out, just out of curiosity. So he goes down to this town, and it's, like I said, it's a pretty small town, a little downtown there. Uh, you know, like I said, it's 1966, so it's a little Main Street or whatever. Not a lot of people around, uh, but he's like, man, I'm, you know, I'm kind of hungry. I'll just, like, stop in and get something to eat or get a beer or something like that. So he goes to this tavern, and when he's on his way into the tavern, like, this guy comes out who is clearly very inebriated and says, like, something really weird to him and then, like, licks his face. <laughs> And so he's just kind of like, okay. Uh, but then the guy that owns the tavern, whose name is George, comes out and it's like, oh, you know, he's just, you know, it's, he's, it's, it's a whole thing. It's like, it, he's harmless. It's fine. Sorry about that. Um, you know, come in and I'll make you some food or whatever. So he gives him like some burgers and stuff and he's super, super nice. And Peter is just kind of like, man, this town, it's like, I feel like I've been here before, even though I absolutely know I have not. But there's something about it that's really, really attractive to him. It's just like kind of like there's this whole, like I said, this whole deja vu about it. There's like a whole nostalgic type of, he's like, there's even like a nostalgic scent to it. It almost smells like smoky, like autumn. And he's like, and I really, and I'm really, really into it. So kind of on a whim, he says, you know, uh, since me and Sylvia have been having so many problems and maybe it'd be good for us to get away for a little while, I'm gonna rent a vacation house, like a vacation cabin, just for three weeks or something like that so we can get away and it'll be like a fresh start and everything. So he goes down to the realtor's office and the realtor, I think his name is Leo, is also super friendly. And he's like, matter of fact, he's like, I have like a really good cabin that normally would be rented by this time of summer, but you know, you lucked out, nobody's rented it for this particular three weeks. And it's this little cabin and it's called Shady Cove. And it's right on the edge of this uh, lake that all the locals call Big Bath. And he shows him pictures and he's like, that looks absolutely perfect. It's very, very quiet and secluded. And he said, you know, matter of fact, two years ago, uh, there was another writer who stayed there named Declan Wade, who was a horror writer. And uh, Peter's like, yeah, I know who the fuck that is. He's like really famous. Uh, and he's like, yeah, he stayed there and he wrote a novel. Like, you know, he wrote one of his best selling novels in that very cabin. So he's like, well, gosh, it sounds like kismet. So he basically, he doesn't even go out to see the place. He just sees the pictures and, you know, Leo seems very nice. So he's just kind of like, okay, so he signs a rental agreement. So he goes back home uh, to tell Sylvia that he rented a cabin and that they're going to do like a vacation for three weeks. Uh, but when he gets there, and like I said, I don't want to spoil too much about this because um, this, like I said, it's kind of better if you don't really see where it's going. But when he gets back home, uh, something bad has happened and it kind of goes from there. Now, interestingly, and I will admit that at this point in the story, this was a little bit jarring for me. So do know that this book, much like some of Stephen King's books, like I said, that are kind of set around, you know, around Derry, Maine or something like that, that are kind of these big sprawling tales about a town. 
this kind of like shifts back and forth to a lot of different character perspectives. So the first part of the book, I don't even remember how many pages it is, but like the first significant chunk of the book, you're following Peter and Sylvia and their whole thing. And then this one bad thing happens when he comes back from renting the place, like before they even go to the cabin. And then for a long time, the perspective of the story like shifts. So it actually shifts to people in Gilchrist. Like it shifts to a, a girl named Grace, who's like a high school girl, and uh, this really shitty dude named Ricky. Ricky Osterman and you know Grace is kind of like her dad is the police chief Delancey so you know they kind of follow him as well so just know going in that like you know you get involved with Peter and Sylvia but then there's like another like the following portion of the book is kind of like more talking about the town of Gilchrist and then it picks back up with Peter and Sylvia later on like when they actually have resolved what the bad thing that happened and then they come to the cabin to do their vacation at which point you know they start like interacting with uh, the locals and stuff like that yeah so the thing with this town it's again it's sort of left a little bit i don't know if i'd say it's left ambiguous but this does have because you know how in stephen king's it you know, you had Pennywise, who was kind of some kind of demon, interdimensional being, something like that. But his whole thing was, you know, he could shape shift essentially into like whatever scared you the most. And he usually targeted children and blah, blah, blah. So this is kind of like that, but not exactly. Um, the antagonists or monsters or whatever uh, of Gilchrist, if you want to call them that, it's not exactly the same. This is kind of more like it's kind of more like a cosmic horror. It is kind of like interdimensional as well. They are described, but you're not really entirely sure what they are. I think they're kind of described at some point as sort of like vampires, but more like psychic vampires, not like vampire vampires. So it's just kind of like that. But the thing that they do is that they feed on fear and they feed on despair. So what they do, and like I said, this is a little bit different to how Pennywise operates, I feel like, although I haven't read it in a while, but I feel like it's kind of different. But the way they operate in Gilchrist is basically what they'll do is they kind of get inside people's heads and make them do awful things. You know what I mean? So it's almost kind of like a little bit of a possession kind of deal. And then when these awful things happen, like all these tragedies ensue, then they kind of like feed on the, um, you know, the fear and despair and things like that that are produced by these things happening. So, and obviously I guess some people are more susceptible to it than others. That's not really stated outright, but I guess it's kind of like implied, you know, so there's that kind of whole thing too. So this is essentially a town that's cursed. Basically all that's kind of said about it is that this is just a place where it so happens that the veil or whatever between our world and the world of these beings, whatever it is they are. Like I said, they're a little bit cosmic horror, Lovecraftian type things. So this town is somewhere where the where the barrier is very thin. So they can kind of like reach across and like influence people's minds and get them to do awful things. Because like I said, Gilchrist, this is a town where, you know, it's mostly a normal town with normal people, but you know, terrible things kind of happen a little bit more, more often than you would think they would and shit like that. So uh, once Peter and Sylvia get to Gilchrist and start to kind of, it's interesting because when they first get there, it's almost kind of, because Sylvia obviously had been having a lot of problems like before they got there. And when she gets there, even though the town is cursed, like I said, and there's these fucking monster things like kind of lurking around the periphery of the dimension or whatever, she's actually like much better when she first gets there. Like they kind of rekindle their romance and she's kind of like much calmer. She's gotten over her grief about the sun dying and she seems to be like in a much better place. But it seems as though that is maybe part of the town's allure. Like it's kind of like drawing people in like, oh, you've been here before. Oh, it's such a nice place or something like that. And like I said, it is a nice place. Like the people that live there aren't weird or anything like that. You know, they're kind of like victims just like everyone else is. But I think that's part of the thing that the monsters kind of have, you know, uh, kind of set it up. So it's almost like alluring for people. So then they can come in there and then they can like fuck people up and all kind of like tragic shit can happen. So that's essentially what you have going on in this town. It's like a cursed town thing. It's beings who are essentially like cosmic horror, interdimensional type beings that feed on people's despair. And so they will manipulate people into, 
doing things that cause like massive tragedy and uh, things of that nature. So that's basically what the story is. So like I said, it does, it is kind of like a Stephen King novel in that way. It's very sprawling. Uh, it's basically set, you know, in one town and it follows a bunch of different characters. So that's one thing about this book. It's like I said, it's quite long. It's over 500 pages and you really have to keep track of all, it, there's not like a fuck ton. It's not kind of like, oh, there's a new character being introduced every five seconds or anything like that. But you do have to realize that at times there'll be like quite a long uh, extended like chapter or two chapters about a particular character or set of characters. And then that set of characters might not come back into the story until like later on. So you do kind of have to like remember who all of these people are and what is going on with all of them. Um, so I kind of feel like the, some of the reviews I read, this seemed to have either like really, really good reviews or like some people were just like, they didn't like it. It was too Stephen Kingy or they thought it was too disjointed or something like that. I didn't find it disjointed. Although, as I said, you really do have to, this isn't one where you can just kind of like turn your brain off and read it. You definitely do have to kind of focus. It's not dense or complicated or anything like that, but there are a lot of characters. This is set in one town and there's a lot of interlocking shit going on and there's a lot of things going on at the same time. So you kind of have to like remember, oh yeah, that's, you know, that's the drunk guy or that's this guy that had this going on. So you do kind of have to like keep track of a lot of plot threads if you really want to get into it. And the thing about it was when I was first reading it, to me, I was kind of like at first, I was like, well, it did seem a little bit disjointed. But then when I finished it and then I thought about it later, I started realizing that there were kind of all these connections that I didn't immediately twig onto when I was reading it, but only kind of like came to light later. I was like, oh yeah, that character in this, and oh, okay, I get it. So uh, so maybe I wasn't reading it as closely as I thought I was, even though I did read this pretty closely because I got super into it. And the thing about it is that, you know, even though there are a lot of characters and it jumps back and forth between them, you know, the handful that you do spend the most time with are really good characters and you really do like have a lot of sympathy for them. Um, so when something awful happens to them and awful stuff happens to a lot of people in this book, the death toll in this book is very, very, very high. So, uh, yeah, so this is definitely not a novel if you want like a happy ending or like a, a really like good, like big resolution or something like that. The ending for this one is, I don't think I'd necessarily call it ambiguous because it's pretty clear what happened, but it is sort of like the ending. It's actually quite sad. And, um, you know, it doesn't get resolved to any great degree, you know what I mean? Which makes sense uh, with the kind of horror that this is. Like I said, this almost struck me as more like cosmic horror. It's kind of like it, it's kind of like the Tommyknockers, it's not really aliens, but it's had that kind of that similar vibe to it. So if that sounds like something you'd be into, like I said, don't go into this like looking for a happy ending or anything like that. And keep in mind that you do have to sort of focus because it jumps back and forth a lot. Uh, I will say that there were a couple of characters in there that I kind of wish a little bit more had been done with, you know, because just there were so many. Like the horror writer that I mentioned earlier, Declan Wade, he does actually show, he doesn't literally show up, but there is kind of like a phone conversation where he like explains some stuff because he had stayed in that same cabin. So he explains the stuff to Peter and everything like that. I kind of wish that more had been done with him because he seemed like an interesting character. And also there was this little boy that was introduced um, that was kind of like, a little bit like Danny in The Shining, like he was kind of like, a, he seemed to have psychic powers. And he was in like a few scenes, but I kind of wish more had been done with that as well. But like I said, in the aggregate, um, yes, this is a lot of characters, but the fact that he was able to like kind of keep them all straight and keep all the associations between them straight, if you pay attention, then most of the stuff is, like I said, I kind of wish there had been more done with those two characters in particular. But other than that, I really don't have any complaints. I got really, really into this book. I thought it was really immersive. And I don't know, I just, there was something about the vibe of this that I really liked. It had that like Stephen Kingy, like 60s nostalgia, small town, creepy type of vibe to it, which I like. Like I said, it was a little bit like Robert McCammon kind of gave me that sort of vibe as well, where it was just kind of this big sprawling, all these people, all this like terrible shit happening. And uh, like I said, and I kind of like that it didn't, 
pull its punches. Uh, you know, it didn't be like, oh, you like this character? There's, nobody had plot armor is what I'm saying. It's like so many people fucking die in this book and in like really, really awful, awful ways. So I like that it's, uh, even though that was kind of a bummer, like in a lot of cases, I like that the book didn't shy away from that. I mean, he just like kill everybody. He didn't kill everybody, but... You know, he killed a lot of people. He killed a lot of people. Uh, but yeah, so if you like uh, Stephen King type stuff that's just kind of like set in one town and it's like town with a secret or like there's creepy shit going on in the town, like I said, like It or the Tommy Knockers, something like that, then, you know, and you're okay with it being, because like I said, I wouldn't call this a pastiche. There's definitely some homage in there because, you know, there's one... There's a couple little characters that he kind of named in homage to like Stephen King characters and stuff like that. So he's doing it deliberately. But to me, that didn't really get in the way of it. I just thought it was like kind of cute. And you know, this, it is Stephen Kingy, but it's not so Stephen Kingy that I was like taken out of it. I was still like really into the story. So if that sounds like something that you would be into, then by all means, check it out. You can, uh, if you have Kindle Unlimited, you can actually read it for free. Or, you know, obviously you can just buy the print book if you would rather do that. But yeah, uh, I liked this a lot. So if you've read it or if it sounds interesting to you, then let me know in the comments uh, what you feel about it. And that will do it for this Tomes of Terror. I will see you guys on the next one. Bye.